Well, hey then, welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, we've been going through Unit 3 of the AP Government Curriculum, and this is the last video for the whole unit. So that means it's time to talk about affirmative action. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well, then let's get to it. So in this video, here's what we're trying to do. Explain how the Supreme Court has at times allowed the restriction of the civil rights of minority groups, and at other times has protected those rights. So let's start by defining affirmative action, and then we'll look at a few cases that give us an idea regarding how the court has ruled on this topic. Affirmative action as a concept describes policies enacted that favor groups that that have been historically discriminated against. And while affirmative action has been in place in some form since the 19th century, the modern version of it has roots in an executive order signed by John F. Kennedy, which was concerning the employment of federal contractors, and it said this. The contractor will take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated during employment without regard to their race, creed, color, or national origin. So that's the idea. Affirmative action takes an active approach against discrimination instead of hoping that passive discrimination laws will result in equity. In other words, a government contractor had to actively seek different minorities to do work for the federal government instead of just opening jobs and saying that anyone who applies can have it. And as you can imagine, such a policy got folks all kinds of angry. And you know, those folks were mostly white people who thought that such a policy, although resembling equality on its face, actually discriminated against them. And that brings us to several Supreme Court cases that have wrestled with this idea of affirmative action. Is it constitutional? or is it not? Now, before we get into the cases, you need to understand the debate underneath the debate. On the surface, these cases were about whether it was constitutional to have minority quotas in various institutions, but under that debate was the more fundamental question, is the Constitution colorblind? On the one side, you had justices who insisted that the Constitution makes no claims regarding race and therefore should not be invoked in racial questions. On the other side are justices who argue that the Constitution forbids racial classifications only when it harms certain races, but does not forbid them if those classifications classifications help historically discriminated races. Okay, so with that understanding in place, let's have a look at how the Supreme Court has ruled on the topic of affirmative action. And, spoiler alert, it is not favorable. In making these rulings, the court is always trying to make the distinction between de jure and de facto segregation. De jure segregation is racial discrimination by law, and the prime example of this was the Jim Crow laws in the South. De facto segregation, on the other hand, is racial segregation by personal choice. For example, during the Great Migration, lots of black families moved to the North and precipitated what's known as the white flight out of the cities into the suburbs. So in that case, racial segregation had occurred between cities and suburbs, but not by law. Rather, it was by the choice of white families moving out of places where black people were living. Now, the court ruled against de jure segregation in Brown v. the Board of Education ruling, and that dismantled the legal structure that supported racial segregation. But in many cases that followed, where de jure segregation was not clear, the court has generally ruled against affirmative action. Now, the clearest example of that is the non-required case of Regents of the University of California v. Baki. In this 1978 case, the University of California's medical school admitted 100 applicants every year, and their affirmative action policy was to reserve 16 of those spots for minorities and women. So that meant for 16 of those spots, minorities and women could have lower qualifications and still beat out white applicants. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what happened to a white applicant named Alan Bakke. He was denied admission and then went ahead and sued the university, saying that the 14th Amendment was violated because he was declined entrance based only on his race. And you're like, wait, wasn't he white? And the answer is yes. That's the point. He said that because the university had established race and gender quotas for admission, that he was the victim of reverse discrimination. Well, the decision handed down in the case was that such mandatory quotas were in fact unconstitutional. However, the court didn't say that affirmative action was unconstitutional, which is to say race could still be used as a factor in determining applicants' qualifications for the school. But race couldn't be the only factor in their decision. Now, this principle was further upheld in another non-required case called Ricci v. De Stefano in 2009. In that case, a group of firefighters took an exam to be promoted within their department. When the scores came back, none of the black firefighters scored well enough to be promoted, and so the city threw out the scores and didn't promote anyone. Well, the high-scoring firefighters sued, and the case eventually came before the Supreme Court, and the court ruled that, again, this was not a case of de jure segregation, but rather the exam appeared to be a good measure of knowledge for the job to which the applicants aspired. And so, in that case, we have another example of the court operating from a colorblind perspective. Okay, that's it. Click right over here to grab a view packet, which is going to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in Maine. If this video helped you, then by all means, subscribe, and that will let me know that you want me to keep making them. I'll see you in the next one. Heimler out.